Who here would like to be happy? Raise your hands. I think we can agree that's easier said than done. Far too often, our own happiness is tied to circumstances and factors that are beyond our control. But what if it was possible for us to actively manipulate our own happiness so that we were in the driver's seat of our emotions? Can we control our happiness even when things don't go our way? Or are we destined to be slaves of circumstance? It was this question which led me to a rather strange and seemingly unrelated field, memory techniques. Take a look at the video above. I have here a random 30-digit number generator that gives a random 30-digit number every time you click go, and one minute on the clock, and I'm going to memorize a random 30-digit number in one minute in three, two, one, go. Starting from the beginning, the number is 02744006897878, followed by 52, followed by 02, followed by 57, followed by 75, followed by 74 followed by 19 followed by 28 followed by 32 followed by 45 Thank you What you've just seen is a small example of a great power of the mind This is a power that we all have but which few of us realize and even fewer of us understand how to use to its full potential Now see this deck of cards right here What if I told you that, in that amount of time, I just memorized this entire deck? I would be, as we say in the world of memory techniques, a liar. But there are people, such as this man, who memorized an entire deck of cards in a world record 13.9 seconds at the 2017 WMSC World Memory Championships. Other feats of memory include memorizing an over 3,000 digit number in an hour and over 100 historical dates in five minutes. What if I told you that everyone here in this audience was capable of performing those same feats and that the people who performed them were not actually gifted geniuses, but normal people, some of whom even struggled to pass high school? To understand how memory relates to controlling our happiness, you must first understand the special techniques that allow normal people, just like you, to do the extraordinary. Now, there are three key elements of memory techniques. Visualization, association, and location. Visualization is the idea that visual images can be remembered far more easily than abstract data. It's the idea that something you could see, touch, or imagine can be recalled far easier than just written text or spoken word. If I told you that yesterday there was a pink elephant dancing on top of my bed, let me ask you, did you not just picture a pink elephant dancing on top of a bed? Did you not just instinctively visualize what I described to you? You do the same when you're reading a book. It's why people describe reading like you're seeing a tiny movie going on inside your head. We are wired to visualize, and it dates back to how we evolved. Knowing where to find food or drinking water was essential to our survival. It's the same reason why Ted has us using images in addition to just giving speeches in our talks. If I came up to you two weeks later and I asked you, hey, what was that image that I described in my talk? I bet you would be able to remember the pink elephant. When the mind creates images, particularly ridiculous ones through imagination, 
those images hold a special significance in the brain. Now, the second element of memory techniques, association, is like a bridge. Not all information, as I'm sure you know, comes with a tangible graphic image. No clear picture comes to mind when I say the number 360 or the word oishi. So what we must do is associate tangible graphic images with those bits of intangible data. Say I wanted to memorize that oishi is the Japanese word for delicious. To me, the word oishi sounds like the word sushi, so I could imagine a delicious sushi roll that I had. And I could take note of the fact that a sushi roll is shaped like an O to remember that it's oishi and not sushi with an S. And what we're doing is we're giving ourselves a logical link from the word to its meaning. You don't have to make any sort of cognitive jump. It's like a bridge that you trace back, and it's all intuitive with each step. And you can do the same thing with numbers. The number 360 actually encodes to the word matches, and I can visualize matches inside my head. In the world of memory techniques, every single number can be encoded into a word or series of words. And that's what I was actually doing in the video above, was encoding those numbers into words to generate graphic pictures that I could then recall. Now, as powerful as these two elements are, there's even more potential when you bring in location. See, right now those images, they're just kind of floating around in abstract land. But say I wanted to memorize multiple images, hundreds of images. Say those images were related. I need location in order to organize all my images together. What you need to do is create what's called a memory palace. Now, you can think of this like a giant filing cabinet, except it's all inside your brain. Now, what you do is you'll pick a familiar journey. It could be a walk to work. It could be walking around your house, a stroll through your favorite park. And you'll choose distinct objects along that journey. So right now, I want you to all close your eyes and picture yourself in your living room. And look around. What do you see? You might see a couch, a chair, a TV the entrance to the kitchen. I know for me, I see my doorbell, and then I look down, I see my doormat, I walk inside, I can see a chair, then I go upstairs, I see my railing, and I see the carpet stain upstairs from when I spilled grape juice as a child. And the key here is that all of these are personal objects that relate to me. And I can recall them easily because they relate to me, and I can recall them in order too. Now what you do is associate those images with the different locations inside your memory palace. So I could visualize my oishi sushi roll where my doorbell should be. And when I go to ring it, I can feel the sticky rice on my finger and see soy sauce dripping down the wall. And just visualize that picture real clearly inside your head. And then I look down at my doormat and I see it's made of a bunch of pretty Hawaiian necklaces to remember that kawaii is the Japanese word for pretty. And the beauty of this is you're not just limited to one palace either. You could use my Japanese home, for example, for Japanese vocabulary words, my hiking trail in Vietnam to memorize facts about Vietnam, my high school could be used to memorize academic information, formulas, dates, etc. Now, at this point, you might be thinking, gosh, this is a lot of work. It sounds pretty complex to memorize a little information. And I don't deny that you must invest a significant amount of time up front to create a system. But, after you invest that time up front, just like learning a language, it soon becomes second nature. And the dividends of your investment pay off tenfold. Just look at the memory athletes. The average person can memorize maybe a 20-digit number, if we're being generous, in about five minutes, while memory athletes can memorize over 500 digits in the same time. That's nearly a 3,000% increase in ability, which is not bad for a little time up front. It's amazing then to think, how can this be applied to education or to memorizing names and faces in a business or social setting? I mean, how useful would that be? And there's been many talks given on that topic. I myself have written papers and given speeches to students. But what I want to do is take this great power of the mind and channel it in a direction that no one seems to be talking about. I want to be able to affect everyone. And I see nothing as more universal than the pursuit of happiness. There's a great piece of wisdom that says happiness is like a butterfly. The more you chase it, 
the more it will elude you. But if you turn your attention to other things, it will come and sit softly on your shoulder. The lesson of the butterfly is not that happiness is unattainable. It's that if we can change our approach, we can get different results. Instead of looking outside, we should turn within. Instead of focusing on external circumstances that are beyond our control, we should focus on our perspective, which is within our control. So of course that begs the question, how can we use our intrinsic abilities to make us happy? I have good news for you. The human mind has the marvelous ability to do what is called holistic episodic recollection. To understand what this means, I have an exercise for you. I want you to close your eyes, and I want you to visualize in great detail the last trip you went on, the last vacation. Just take a moment, replay all the mini highlights. Who were you with? What were you doing? What did it feel like? Now, chances are you felt yourself experiencing a taste of the emotions you felt before. No doubt what you did from this basic exercise was nowhere near as vivid as what you experienced in real time. But as the science has shown us, simply by recalling a fond memory, we experience sensations of happiness triggered by that very memory. And you probably experienced a stronger example of this if you found yourself looking through a photo album or reminiscing with your friends about the good old days. Consider how long some of the top highlights last for, whether it be getting a first kiss, proposing in marriage, holding a handstand for the first time, receiving a graduation diploma. These moments last mere seconds, yet the sense of self-pride, fulfillment, and accomplishment we get lasts far longer. The duration of pleasure from our experiences extends far past the lifespan of those experiences themselves. Much of the pleasure actually comes from holistic, episodic recollection and not the actual experience itself. And this is key, this is huge. Now we can start to see how memory relates to our emotions. The golden link is holistic episodic recollection. The challenge is that fond memories can always be thought of at will. I have another challenge for you. Challenge, let's see if you're up for it. I want you to try to picture, think back, what the highlight of your day was last Tuesday. The highlight of your day last Tuesday. Now chances are, if you're like most people, you forget. And this is because we do have the tendency to forget, even the good memories. So that leaves us with two challenges. The first is, how do we ensure we don't forget all these wonderful memories that we have? And the second is, how can we ensure that we access them without the need for something external like a photo album? I mean, it's simply impractical to carry around the photo album all the time. What we need is a concrete method that we can use 100% of the time. And as you might be able to guess, that's where memory techniques come in. What I propose is that we start creating memory palaces of our own experiences. So what does that look like? Well, for me, I see rock holds carved into my bed to remind me of the time I went rock climbing in Rayleigh Beach. I see my window made of the thick, dark brown sand that I went sandboarding on in the UAE. And through this method, we can access hundreds of memories to motivate us, inspire us, empower us when we need to. And there's all kinds of adaptations. It's not just limited to feelings of pleasure. Anger, compulsiveness, anxiety, sadness can all be combated. I remember a time I got into a harsh argument with my father, and the following day he told me that even though I sounded angry, he knew I was responding out of my own pain because what he said matters so much to me. And I thought to myself, if I could only remember that, hear those words, see that sorrow on his face, the next time I felt compelled to argue back, that I could keep my emotions in perspective. Memory techniques can do that. See, what you can do is pick out a distinct feature on the person's face. For example, my dad always used to furrow his brows when he's angry. And you can associate that with something to remind you of the lesson. So I could see a long needle sticking into that brow and imagine it recoiling, and that's why it's wrinkled up. 
to remember that even if my dad may be speaking to me harshly, that he's hurting inside, and that's why he's speaking like that. And I could see tears coming from the point where that needle stuck into the brow to remind myself of the sadness and sorrow and the consequences. Now, I'm sure you've heard the advice of keeping it in perspective, remembering these lessons, focusing on the positives, but the reality is, I think it just comes out as hollow advice and platitudes without any sort of concrete way to remember. What memory techniques offer us is that bridge, that link from one point to the next so that we can remember in the heat of the moment, we can keep the issue in perspective. And that's the power of memory techniques. It's the association, it's the bridge. And by the way, this is not just limited to serious grand life events. You could create a memory palace of your daily highlights. The delicious salad you ate, the friendly hello you got from a stranger, the beautiful sunset you saw. The mind can become a journal of empowerment. And there's what I call a dual benefit of this. Not only are you becoming more happy, but you're actually being more mindful. You're becoming originally aware of your own experiences. You're not just focusing on the daily stressor, you're actually focusing on each one of these microscopic positive moments that we tend to ignore. And in cherishing even the little things, it's an act of gratitude. And gratitude, as science has told us, is one of the key components to living a fulfilling life. When writers write novels, artists create paintings, and musicians make songs, what they're really doing is they're bearing witness to their emotions. They're making peace with their experiences by conjuring them up and preserving them on a canvas. We can be artists of our own right in our minds. As I'm older now, I've found that time has been going by faster and faster. And I tell this to adults and they just chuckle and tell me, life just gets faster. So I found myself asking, before the next 25 years was by, how can I slow down life? And I don't have the answer, but I do have the following hypothesis. Slow down life by learning to notice. Turn off autopilot. This is not just something to do in passing. It's a new way of actively looking at the world, seeing the world through lenses of gratitude and mindful awareness. We can combat sadness, frustrations, anger, and cheer ourselves up when we need to. And it's all intrinsic, it's within here. We have that power through memory. Let's retake that power. Let's discover beauty with our emotions. Let's make peace and harmony within ourselves. Thank you.